Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, today, we have Jean Harper on the podcast. I'm very, very excited about having you on. Thank you so much for joining us today. For those that don't know who uh, Jean Harper is, she, she's written very recently a fantastic audiobook called Lazarus Remembered. Uh, I've heard extracts of it already, and it, it, it sounds absolutely amazing. It's powerful. There's some stunning music that you've got in there and some singing. And it's a really, really interesting story as well. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but it is it's out and it's available at the moment. Um, and I strongly recommend everyone to, to, to get out there and, and, um, and to listen to this, this audio book. Uh, but before we go down that path... Very well. Well, first of all, thank you, Warren. It was lovely of you to invite me. And yeah, the pleasure's all mine. So yeah, I'm great. Very well indeed. Thank you. Good, good. Yeah. And, and where are you at the moment? Well, currently I'm in the southwest of France. That's actually where I live. Um, so we're sort of, I don't know how well you know the area or how well your, your um, viewers know it, but we're sort of between Toulouse and Bordeaux. Okay. So bang in the middle between the two. Yes, oh. and beautiful sort of a uh, rugged landscape and um, not far from all the wine growing areas of Bordeaux, Amazing. just slightly east of that. Yeah, it is stunning. Absolutely. It's very inspiring. It's a very yeah, inspiring yeah. place to live. Yeah. yeah Lovely. Yeah. And, and, and how's the weather over there at the moment? Because it's where I am, it's absolutely freezing. So uh, I'm hoping you have a bit of sunshine to make me feel a little better. <laughs> Well, well, yeah, I kind of feel bad for saying, yeah, it is absolutely <laughs> lovely. <laughs> no, it's, it hasn't, it's been bitterly cold. I mean, we do have very cold winters. Um, yeah. We have real seasons, but yes, it's beautiful here. Literally spring sprang yesterday and we're jumping into about 17, 18 degrees centigrade over the next, uh, well, today and the next few uh, wow. weeks. So, yeah feels lovely and it really has got that sense now I, I love that sense of possibility of spring you start to see things you know the the, the change in colors and the landscape it's beautiful yeah. yeah 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 oh well there we go so um for writing audiobooks you were doing something completely different and I wanted to just uh explore that area first of all um uh, so you were in science you were a, a research scientist have I got that correct Absolutely correct. Yes. Okay, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. So I, um, well, yes. I mean, it, the way it all started when I was a, a child, I wanted to be a vet when I grew up. So that yes, was like, yes. I loved animals and I thought that that's the future. And so whilst I found, I love literature and reading and I'd always wanted to write a novel. It was, it was the idea of working with animals drove me down a path of uh, going into science. And I actually found it much more difficult. Um, I think naturally find the humanities easier, but I was determined to become a scientist. Uh, in the event I didn't become a vet, I, I went to the vets to do a work experience and with about, within about half an hour of getting there, I fainted. <laughs> so yeah. realized that it possibly wasn't the career for me. <laughs> um, so, but I still pursued a scientific um, career. Yes, I studied nutrition and biochemistry. And I was actually in, in um, a student for seven years, degree, master's degree, PhD, and, uh, and then sort of stayed in that, that field and pursued a career in research and communications for about 25 years. Yeah. Incredible. So yes, that now, was what, my, yeah, what, that was my background. What were you researching? What was what was the general? Was it just science in general, or were you honing a particular area? Or well, I actually worked for a pet food company, and okay. my uh, role was to understand the interaction of the food with the animal. So, yeah. you know, what makes an animal choose a certain food? Um, what happens in terms of digesting it? Are there things we can include in the food to help the animal be? healthier and to live longer so yeah that was when it actually turned out to be the perfect role for me so it combined my love of animals with my curiosity about science and nature so yeah I absolutely loved it um I moved more into the communication side later on but it was hard work like all jobs are you know it's quite exacting mm. um so yes it's uh, it, and then what happened was the company I worked for um was 
like a lot of companies, I was uh, able to retire quite early. So I took that opportunity and uh, yeah, and then moved into writing. Wow, lovely. Yeah. Um, and this wasn't a question I was going to ask you, but do you have a favorite animal? You've mentioned your love of animals. Do you have a favorite <laughs> animal that you could tell us about? <laughs> I mean, I love dogs and cats. They're just right. wonderful. I have a dog and I have three cats. But if I had to name a favourite animal, oddly enough, I would choose the camel. Wow. <laughs> there's just, I know, there's just something so, I mean, you look at them and think, how did anything like that come to evolve? Yeah. And there's just that sort of majesty about them and, and grace that I uh, I love. So, yes, if I had to pick one, that's what it would be. <laughs> there we go, a camel. I did not expect you to say that. <laughs> Um, that's brilliant. Love it. Love it. Good, good, good. Um, okay. And then, so then after that, you went down, uh, you, you then wrote this, this book, um, Lazarus Remembered. Uh, can you, can you tell us, uh, the inspiration behind, uh, behind the book itself? I think, um, so for me, what I wanted to do was write a book that made, um, other people feel the way I like to feel when I've read mm. a book. And I love an emotional connection. That's what I'm always interested in. It, with any art, actually, I want something that, you know, brings me joy or, or terrifies me or, you know, brings, it makes me sad. I want to feel, I want those emotional buttons pushed. So for me, that was the starting point to, yeah. to ensure that I created a story with characters that you cared about enough that you would actually invest in, you would have an em emotional investment. And that was one bit. And the other thing I love about, uh, or the, the novels that are my favorites are always the ones where I'm caught out, where I think I knew what was going on. And then suddenly there's a great twist, you know, and who doesn't love that? And that's kind of another emotion. That's the, the shock or the surprise. And then sometimes the anger at yourself thinking, why did I not see that? Why yeah. did I? allow myself to be carried along um so you know for me a novel like Rebecca Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca is perfect in that respect you know what you think is going on you suddenly discover halfway through that you were seeing the world through the uh, main protagonist's eyes and she was not seeing things as they were so I I loved that so that was the starting point I knew how I wanted people to feel mm, um mm. and then the other side of it is that I um, something I feel quite strongly about is people placing judgments on other people's choices and other people's lives okay. and the decisions they make and how often we'll kind of gossip or, or, or make statements about other people based on very little um, <laughs> or based on how we think they should be living their lives, you yeah, know, what yeah. they should be doing. Absolutely. And it's that, yeah, it's, it's something that really... Um, kind of niggles at me so again the basis for the story which I won't go into in too much detail because it gives away the the ending the big reveal okay, was okay. around that about someone that um, made a choice in his life and um, who are we to judge that choice is made and so it's all about getting you know actually you empathize I hope you empathize with Peter the main protagonist a lot and then um, gradually start to understand the life he's chosen and um, and hopefully have some empathy to, about that decision. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us any more about the story itself, apart from what you've mentioned just now? Is there any anything else you can give us that won't give away the ending and ruin the conclusion of the story? Like, <laughs> where is it set, for example? And um, yeah, what, what 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 the general the plot line is for for, for Lazarus Remember? That'd be very interesting to hear. Oh, of course, yeah. So, um, well, the story starts with this guy called Peter. He's a, um, a guy, he's 50 years old, and he's, walk, he's living in the UK, and he's woken up one morning by a phone call from a friend to tell him that Lydia, his mother, is dying. And that's the opening. And then what, we, what transpires very quickly is we discover that Peter um, was Australian by birth. He grew up in a town called Lazarus. And at the age of 18 or 19, he walked away from that town. He walked away from his family, from his friends, from his community. He left everything behind. He severed all ties and he hasn't been back. Okay. So that's the setup, um, if you like. And then through dual timelines, we follow Peter's story. So he goes back to Australia and 
so it's all about the consequences of choosing to go back. Yeah. Um, and then through the alternating timeline, we follow his story from literally from when he's born up until the events that precipitated his, his exile. Okay. And it really is the very end when you discover what led to his departure. Yeah. Wow, so that's, that sounds so exciting. It sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think what I discovered, Warren, which is, is something very, very interesting, and I heard other people say this, that often the story will write itself, Yeah. which I found kind of hard to believe. But once I started writing, I realised, wow, that's I never imagined that to be part of this story. And I think what can happen is you finish up with a lot of threads and then the art of it is at the end to cut some of them if they're not adding, yeah. but then to weave the rest together. And so actually the story I finished up with was not the one I started out to write, is the oh, honest okay, answer. Okay. It's that's fascinating. So, it's, yeah, that is amazing. Uh, that is so amazing. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so... I, I'm I'm sort of just amazed that uh, someone with your background can can move from science and and, and communication <laughs> and what what sounds and appears to be so so academic to then be able to just almost jump into a whole different world and and and, and create this this piece of work and it's um did you do any training to, as a writer or or how did your skill for writing develop how, did you do it on the side when you were younger as a as a as a passion or yeah well, how did how did you actually learn to to do that because it's not easy writing I've tried yeah. and I find it very hard yeah. and um yeah I'm amazed I really am <laughs> <laughs> well thank you yeah I mean it was it wasn't easy totally agree mm. but it was fun um I think well as I would always harbor this ambition to write a novel um and I'm a, an avid reader I mean I've read books all my life um you know I, I never really gave up on novel reading um it's kind of, it was always my escape from you know the stresses and strains of the, the day job is to yeah. be transported by a great novel um and so in a way because I had that background as a reader I knew what I liked in a story so that was an easy starting point the actual skill though is completely different so as a technical writing is very, very different. I mean, th you don't need to worry about taking the reader on an emotional journey, you know, when you're writing a scientific paper. It's certainly yeah. not what you set out to do. Um, and, if you can, it's a bonus, um, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, yes. I mean, that really would be a skill. Um, and you don't need to worry about things like rhythm or pace or yeah. what makes good dialogue or anything like that. You know, there's a structure, there's an introduction, materials and methods results, discussion, conclusion. It's very structured. There's a protocol that you follow. And suddenly not to have that, I mean, but of course there's a structure to story, as you know, we all innately understand the, mm. the basic shape stories take, but you have so much more freedom. And so what I, I, I probably did use my analytical skills um, in as much as I got a lot of books on how do you write and studied them and worked out very quickly what I could do relatively easily. Mm. And then the areas that I just really struggled with. Mm. And I kind of made a list of each. <laughs> and then I worked like crazy on the ones that I struggled with. Um, I joined a writers group locally. So there's a lot of writers in this area. It's a very inspiring area. So with a few other friends actually, who were also writers of one form or another, we used to get together and, and actually one of the most difficult things ever, I'll never forget, this is the first thing I'd written was handing it over to other people to read. Yeah. I mean, that is, yeah. oh yeah. my. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, I it's, can imagine. It's, yeah, and, and it wasn't very good. It really wasn't, but I was okay with that. I didn't expect it to be, mm. but I was kind of thirsty for this. So tell me what works, tell me what doesn't work. I want to fix it. So yeah, I did. I was in the writers group for several years, actually. I, as I say, I, li I listen to a lot of books on um, how to write. So I walk a lot and I run a lot and I'm always listening to something and I just devoured books on the craft. And each, a lot of them are the same, but each one you'll pick up something and think, ah, that's interesting. I'm yeah. going to put that into practice, yeah. yeah. And so, so yeah, it was a slow prose. Probably took me four years in all from okay. start starting to write a novel to having the finished product yeah um 
and because I, the whole time I was honing the craft, I'd go back to something I'd written, you know, a year earlier, and then just like face palm. Oh, here we go. <laughs> back to the drawing back board. To the drawing board. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, at the end of it, what's nice now is because I've started a second novel and some stuff that was so difficult initially, you know, and um the first time around now just feels like second nature there's still a lot to improve on there always will be I don't think there's ever a writer who can never improve but yeah sure, sure, so that sure. was the process yeah and I did one wow. or two courses as well which were fun yeah yeah well it sounds like you're very active very proactive and you're just you've got all this knowledge that you, you just love get, getting new knowledge on board and learning new skills and they, I, that, that must go a, an awful long way and the beauty of an audiobook is that you can sort of listen to these anywhere as well like on the go walking running you know, in the car. I, I mean, I personally, I listen to audiobooks uh, more than I do actually read a novel for, for that very reason. You can sort of continue yeah. with your, your yes. day and have this wonderful story coming in as well. So it's great. Um, were you involved in the production process at all? Like oh, in, yes. Yeah, yeah. In, 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 the, in the studio with, 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 yeah. with the actress yeah. that was reading it and yeah. How, oh, how, yeah, how, yeah. How was that? How was that process? Like being in, in and amongst it all in the studio and it was honestly that so the the narrator is a, an actor called Francesca Tomlinson yeah. you'll have heard her voice and I've known her uh, actually since the day she was born <laughs> because she's she's my um one of my oldest friend's daughters and I really wanted her to do it mm -hmm. um so she came here so we, uh, my husband um has a as I said he's a composer he has a small studio and we decided to record it ourselves here Maybe. um now it took Francesca Chess, I'll call her because that's okay. that's how I know I had it took Chess, it took us nine days to do the first recording. Now normally she says it would take three or four days, you know, she'd be in the studio with a sound engineer and they just sit and you know work a really long, hard day to get it done in three or four days. Yeah. Whereas here, I mean, first of all, for me, I'm not an actor and I knew nothing about the craft. And watching an actor at work is just extraordinary. So uh, you know, and we'd start every day by discussing the characters. So, you know, the, how's this character going to sound? You know, where's the voice coming from? Is it a yeah. deeper voice? Is it more on the lips? So, and she would get into character and watching her, for example, do dialogue. So it's it was mainly dialogue. So there was rarely more than two people speaking, you know, to one another. There was one or two conversations where there were three or more. But just watching her physically move during the dialogue, you know, she a one position for one character and then there'd just be the slightest nuance and should move into another one honestly it was amazing and then hearing a brain these characters that were in my head and that I could visualize but hearing them come alive honestly it was the most extraordinary experience and I I'm amazed that when I, well, when she told me that a lot of, all, well, most authors don't actually go through that experience. Cause I would just say as an author, it was an absolute privilege to watch yeah. an actor at work like that. And it felt very connected. I think we had a real, you know, we, we made changes on the fly. So, I mean, Chess did an amazing job because she comes from the Northeast of England, same mm -hmm. as me, but actually she was narrating in an, a soft Australian accent. So this guy that's been exiled for 30 years, so yeah, a very yeah. soft Aussie accent. So she was actually narrating in an accent other, and, uh, other than her own, which is not really advisable. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, it's tough. Uh, it's, tough. it's very I, tough. I was yeah, amazed. Then, at, yeah, I, when I heard her voice, I, I, I picked up the accent, the Australian accent, but, but often when people that are not from a particular country they 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 not overdo it but but it's a very it's a very stock accent and I felt felt like she was incredibly subtle and it was it was yeah. supernatural and believable and I, I I remember thinking that as I heard it I was like that's an Australian accent but it wasn't like whoa that's an Australian accent yeah. it was like oh yeah okay that's yeah but it was it was really well really well placed um so yes. yeah she did an yeah. excellent job an excellent job no, she did a fantastic job. And I mean, she was switching uh, usually between Australian and Welsh. So when we go back to Lazarus and the, the and we go back to the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, the family, they're part, very much part of the Welsh community. Yeah. And that helped as a listener 
to distinguish between characters when you've got very different accents and and also you know um different inflection of the voice and that kind of thing so she was often switching accents but something i learned as an author <laughs> which didn't help her at all <laughs> was occasionally i would like have a character who literally had one line let's say in the uk and they'd be a scott or they'd be from ireland oh. And to switch, so she's switching Australian Welsh, Australian Welsh, and then suddenly she has to do one line in an Irish accent. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can imagine, yeah. yeah she said a brain was just, so there was actually one character we quickly changed because it just wasn't working. I just wrote it as Scottish because she found Scottish easier because it's more similar to her natural accent. Yeah. So that was the benefit of being in the studio. We hit her chain. We have the freedom to do what we want. So, yeah, the, so there were uh, lots of things like that that, yeah, we had. The, the, uh, freedom to make changes yeah I love that yeah, um, it's yeah. so cool that you're all in there together in the studio and your husband is so your yeah. husband yeah. did all of the sound and created yes. the music for, for, yeah. for the story yeah that's incredible. yeah that's incredible. yes the, the he had not expected that side of it so he had a very clear vision of how he wanted it to sound yeah so Andy has an incredible ear much 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 more sensitive uh than mine and he knew the feeling of the audio that you wanted to create. So that sort of intimacy you get when someone's telling you a story and they're sat next to you and yeah. you really feel like they're speaking to you, you know, that a real warmth and intimacy, yeah. um, which again meant that the way we recorded it was, wasn't how you would usually necessarily record it. So there's a, you know, it's a, a very open sound, which of course then is more difficult to edit technically. Mm. And as it happened, Andy then finished up um, doing the sound editing for the whole 12 hours, which was quite, <laughs> and that is not his background at all. So okay. he really had to work and study and learn at that. And that was, um, it was kind of one of those odd things that because of the circumstances of 2020, where, you know, our freedom to move and the, the normal day-to-day -day life changed completely, mm. it actually, in an unexpected positive way gave Andy the freedom to uh, have the time to work on that for basically the best part of the year okay. to to take the recording that we did at the end of 2019 and then turn that into you know a seamless production yeah, yeah. you must have been so proud when the whole thing came together and you 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 got it out there because you all work yes. together, you work together as a family, and you know you've made this amazing piece, and then you put it out there, and it seems like a lot of uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears has gone into it. Pete, look, mate, I'm sorry, but there's no easy way to say this. Lydia's dying. Did we get here? Uh, it's yeah. awesome. And you mentioned Thank earlier you. you're now you're now working on uh, a second. Uh, is it another audio book or? I haven't decided yet okay. um, because, uh, but I think probably, yes. I mean, I have a real passion for audio books. I think for all kinds of reasons. I mean, you said earlier, the beauty of them is, you know, if you're driving or walking or doing chores, whatever, yeah. Yeah. you can still engage in a story. And if, you know, you're someone that loves storytelling. And so to be denied that because, you know, you haven't got the time to sit and read, I think is a shame. Yeah. Uh, so I, because I love audio books so much and I love, for me personally, they have a real impact. You know, a great actor telling a story has twice the impact for me than me just reading it, you know, yeah. on the, the written word. And also I think there's an awful lot of people that love storytelling, but for whatever reason, reading mm. doesn't come easily, whether, you know, you're visually impaired or, you know, you haven't had the right, or you haven't had an education that helps you to easily read, I think. Then an audiobook is a wonderful way of, of 
of sharing novels. So I'm very, very tempted to stay with that <laughs> approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, is it is it super early days? Do you have a story uh, story in place, a structure for it at the moment, or is it? Are you just sort of like throwing some ideas around, or yeah, what what, what stage are you at with the second? Uh, with the second. Well. Book? It's about a quarter written. So I know, so I'm a planner. So I, 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 I know that certain writers literally just, you know, start writing and see where it goes. Yeah, and then yeah. others literally know, you know, scene by scene, exactly how it's going to be structured. Yeah. I start, I am more of a planner. So I need to know how something's going to end mm. in order to map the journey. Um, so I, but because of my learnings last time around, I know I don't need as much of a plan in order for it to work. So I, so the basic structure is there. I know what the story is about. I know where it's set. I've written about 25,000 words, so about a quarter of the way in. Wow. Um, yes, so, and <laughs> I'd like to finish that this year. That would be, a, at least to have it written this year. You know, yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. kind of one of my goals for 2021. Amazing, amazing. And uh, okay, so you, yeah, in, in, what about in 2020? I, I ask um, all of my guests that come on how that impacted your life, work, uh, the way you, you were doing things, operating. Uh, it was a very, and it still is, you know, testing for a lot of people at the moment, even into 2021. Yeah. Uh, this uh, I, we don't need to mention, or maybe we should mention it for our listeners, but obviously COVID and, and the impact that that's had. But how was that for you as, as a creator? Did that have an impact? Did that slow things down for you? Or were you able to navigate around that? Yeah. It's, a, it's a great question because I think it had multiple impacts. I think initially, so in France, we went into a lockdown in mid-March last year, which lasted about six weeks. Yeah. And... I found myself unable to do anything. I was just glued to what was happening in the world. You know, I'd never seen anything like it. And I was quite shocked by what was going on, you know, and people dying in terrible numbers and terrible circumstances. And so I became paralyzed in terms of even reading. I've always been a reader, but I couldn't concentrate. It was just too much. So that, and the other downside for me is I love walking and I, um, that's when I'm at my most creative I'm either listening to audiobooks or I'm plotting and planning and thinking yeah. about my own but um, part of the restriction here was that you could only go outside for an hour maximum per day within a one kilometer radius of oh. your house Wow! so my the time when I'm you know, when I'm inspired and being creative was sort of taken away from me yeah. so that was the downside as the year progressed you know, I think we all came a bit more to terms with what was going on. The initial shock went into something more akin to a mild despair. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, I think we sort of became accustomed to what was going on. And, and so towards the end of the year, um, I was more or less back on track. And that's when I started writing the second novel. But the other really positive thing I would say is that uh, I, that's when I joined the book community on ah. Instagram. Oh, lovely. So, yeah, so that was about June or July last year. And that was just fantastic. What a revelation because I couldn't, I mean, I belong to reading groups here, but of course we haven't seen one another. No. Um, and so a lot of, you know, the, the social aspects of our lives, I think have all been thrown up in the air. But this mm -hmm. lovely community on Instagram, suddenly it was there and I could talk to people about novels I was reading and novels they were reading. And it was a real lifeline. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, so that was one of the best outcomes Maybe. of uh, 2020, yeah. Good, yeah. good. So it seems like you you did manage to overcome that initial period of of shock, and then yeah. um, you know the, you then move forward and you you join the the book reading club, and then for, and then you've gone yeah. on to to make this wonderful story. That's such a such a lovely <laughs> thing to hear. It's great. It's it's, it's a really nice thing to hear. Um, okay, good. So in terms of life achievements, I would love to know a couple of things that you've been super proud of. It doesn't specifically have to be work related. It can be a life achievement. It can be climbing a mountain. It could be visiting a particular country, uh, a, a wild food that you've never tried before that you decided <laughs> to try, whatever it is. Um, uh, yeah. Do you have any of those moments where you're just like, I'm, I will never forget that experience? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I mean, I think one of them would be um, 
the first marathon I ran. Oh. So I, I didn't take up long distance running, well, marathon running until I was in my 50s. Okay. And so I ran my first marathon at the age of 52. Wow. And that yeah, is, that's the... inspiration for everyone. <laughs> and I'm going to get out now and go running. That's yeah, and I mean, it, it really wasn't. It's, it's an interesting thing, actually, about lo- uh, marathon running in particular, not just long distance running, but it, there does seem to be a trend that older people do better at it. And one of the theories about that is it's because of the um, the mental discipline that's required okay. and kind of life trains you for discipline, you know, so you get to a certain age and you know the only way you ever succeed at something is to put in the hours yeah. And to push yourself and push yourself and push yourself. And so actually crossing the finishing line for the first time, I've I've since done six, so I've done six marathons in total. Um, Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, And so that is definitely, I would say for me, you know, hugely proud of that. Uh, When you said earlier that you loved running, I thought it was just a little run around the park, you know. (laughs) listen to the birds <laughs> chirping and all that kind of thing wow that's that is impressive incredible incredible yeah all right so, well, yeah. Then... yeah yeah so that would and the other one i would say as well is is finishing and publishing a novel yeah yeah because it, it actually i was going to say is i think you know as an artist actually you give something of yourself you expose yourself and say okay here's my creative output and it does take a lot of courage it would be much easier to create something and then hide it in a drawer because no one can ever critique it or you know so so I think actually having the courage to do that is yeah. another thing that, well it's that it's the vul- vulnerability factor isn't it it's it's, yes. your work, it's what means so much to you and then you're you're sort of hoping that people are going to enjoy it and um, appreciate it and yeah I can imagine that would be tough I'm immensely distracted all of a sudden because we have a, a cameo appearance that's just popped in behind you you're you have a lovely cat Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just coming oh, to say hello there. <laughs> that's Vincent, yes. Oh, hello, Vincent. Vincent. Hello, Vincent. He's quite in it. Yes, most people in the, the community that I'm on on uh, Instagram know Vincent. He makes uh, a regular appearance. Yeah, and he's go. called Vincent because uh, he has he only has one ear. So oh. we named him after Vincent van Gogh because he's a redhead with one ear. <laughs> there we go. There we yes, go. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so for, for everyone watching this on YouTube, you'll be able to see Vincent, but uh, for those that aren't, he's just nicely perched. He's enjoying the sun coming in through the window. He's having a lovely time. Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. Um, all right, good. So um, where where's the best place for people to contact you or reach out to you if they would like to find out more about your uh, Lazarus Remembered, about you yourself? Of course, yes. So we have a website and it's um, conveniently called LazarusRemembered.com. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, if you go on there, there's a contact form. Um, to, and there's also, there's lots of other information. There's bios of all the people involved in uh, in Lazarus Remembered. Yeah. Um, and also I'm on Instagram as well as EJ Harper Author. And, mm-hmm. you know, I love connecting with people that love books and love stories. And yes, that's another way you can message me there. Awesome. That's probably the two two easiest ways to find me. Yeah. And I'm on Twitter as well as AJ Harper author. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, for our listeners out there, at the end of the episode, we're going to play a few extracts from Lazarus Remembered. We'll have the trailer on the YouTube channel, and then we're actually going to play uh, an audio segment for uh, the podcast platforms as well. So you get to hear and get a taste for the story. Uh, and you you will then very quickly realize how amazing it is and be desperate to get out there and and <laughs> and, uh, and by that by that wonderful story um before we go uh, i know you're a busy lady we're going to play a little game if you don't mind gene a uh, bit, <laughs> bit of would you rather i'm going to ask you five questions this is where i turn into a game show host uh i don't know why <laughs> my voice suddenly changes and everything but uh anyway um good so uh yeah are you ready to go five questions don't yeah. give it too much thought the first thing that pops into your head off we go number one okay. would you rather own your own boat or your own plane um i love the water but no plane okay 
playing yet. The idea of never having to check in or stand in a queue <laughs> yeah. or lose my yeah. luggage again yeah, is yeah, very yeah. appealing. Yeah. yeah. No, I second that. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> all right. Number two, would you rather see what was behind every closed door or be able to guess the combination of every safe on the first try? See what's behind every closed door. Uh, although I might get some nasty surprises. <laughs> yeah. Well. yeah, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Who knows? No, I think that's what, yeah. It, could, yeah, it yeah. could be a comedy, a thriller or a horror. I know. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> yeah. All right, number three. Yeah. Uh, would you rather be able to dodge anything, no matter how fast it's moving, or be able to ask any three questions and have them answered accurately? The second one, I'd rather be able to ask any three questions. Um, that's the scientist in me, I think. I'd, I'd, they would be biggies like, you know, are we alone in the universe? That kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Nice, 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 nice. All right, number four, uh, two more. Uh, would you rather be forced to dance every time you heard music or be forced to sing along to any oh, song God. you heard? <laughs> so dancing or singing to so, everything. That's an easy one. I think for everybody else's sake, it would be dancing because you don't <laughs> want to hear me singing. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. I actually do. I would love to hear you sing. But anyway, uh, I won't put you on the spot. I won't do that to you. Um, all right, number five. Would you rather have all your clothes fit perfectly or have the most comfortable pillow, blankets and sheets in existence? The second one, a, a comfortable pillow is my idea of heaven. Yeah, that would be my desert island luxury, a comfortable there we go. pillow. There we go. Yeah, very there we easy. Go. Comfortable Thank pillow on, on a private plane flying around. Yes. Everywhere. Never checking in. Yes. Very good. Very good. Absolutely. They're great questions. They're really, really good. <laughs> really provocative. Yeah. 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 Um, good. Good answers. All right. So very lastly, Jean, uh, we would love mm -hmm. your final thoughts. Uh, positive, uplifting thoughts for our audience on approaches to life, how they can deal with positive or negative change, that sort of thing. I, the thing I would say there is um, it's never too late. So, you know, as I said, I ran my first marathon at the age of 52 and I published my first novel. I'm in my mid 50s now. And I often think, there's a point you get, you can get to in your life. Or I hear people say, oh, well, what's, what's the point of me doing this now? I'm 60 or I'm 75, you know, I'm 75. What's the point of learning to play the piano at my age? You say, well, in five years time, you're still, you're gonna be 80 and you'll either be an 80 year old that can play the piano or an 80 year old that can't. So which one do you wanna be, you know? So yeah. for me, it's like, it's never too late to try something new. And uh, that would be my absolute philosophy on life. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Never too late, guys. You heard it here first. All right. <laughs> Get out there and run that marathon. Come on. <laughs> no excuses now, no Warren. No excuses. Yeah. I know, I know. Oh, dear. Um, all right. I, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Uh, yeah. All oh, right. okay. You heard yeah. it here first. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I just said that. Oh, dear. Why did I say that? No, I have to do it. Uh, all right, uh, Jean, thank you so much for today. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on and it's been a really interesting uh, listen. You're a fascinating person and uh, get out there and uh, listen to Lazarus Remembered, everyone. It's, uh, it's awesome. And uh, yes, have a lovely day. Enjoy the Brilliant. sunshine. Um, yes. I'm not jealous. I'm not jealous at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> As I look out my no. window at snow and wind, it's fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> snow's lovely Warren snow's Snow beautiful lovely. it is beautiful it is beautiful yeah okay. all right Jean brilliant thank much. you very much okay bye bye Pete look mate I'm sorry but there's no easy way to say this Lydia's dying I looked over my shoulder, although goodness knows what I expected to see. The combination of a few hours sleep and an empty stomach had tricked my frazzled brain. From the garden, a blackbird called. Light flickered across the kitchen floor and the lavender faded. An image drifted into my head. Lydia walking towards a car, her steps short and purposeful. It's twilight. 
the sun is disappearing behind the blue mountains and the shouts of cockatoos fill the spring air. It ground to a halt next to Uncle Bob. He jumped back and flattened himself against the muddy falcon. Mum went down the window. Sorry, Bob. Bit difficult to drive with a cracked rib. She didn't wait for an answer. She revved the engine, waved out the car window, and we set off. Honestly, quite honestly, your tragedy staggers me. Honestly, quite honestly, frankly, it bores me. Next up, Dingo Montel with a song for all the young lovers out there. Take it away, Dingo. Oh, come dance with me. Give me your hand. Let's kiss and show. Kettle clicked off and Lydia vanished. A realization began to dawn on me. For 30 years, I'd stayed away. But now, I desperately wanted to return home to Lazarus. Lazarus Remembered. A story told with words and music. Novel by E.J. Harper. Read by Francesca Tomlinson. Music by Andy Harper. Just waiting. How did we get here?